So welcome very much to this event on the situation in Lebanon and the important roles that churches are playing today here in the Swiss Hub. Um, my name is Marina Dörke. I'm the program manager for church cooperation at HEX, Swiss Church Aid. And with me, I have two wonderful speakers from our partner churches in Lebanon and the Middle East. And I would like to briefly ask you to introduce yourselves to the audience, your name, role, and a quick overview of your church. Well, I'm Joseph Kassab. I'm Secretary General of the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon. Uh, uh, the, the word evangelical is uh, confusing these days. So we are reformed in theology and Presbyterian in polity. So uh, we, so the Nessel or the Synod uh, consists of 38 uh, congregations in Syria and Lebanon, and we have 11 schools, formal schools, uh, seven in Lebanon and four in Syria. We have uh, two nursing homes and three clinics, two, one, uh, one in, in Syria and two in Lebanon. We're trying to serve the people. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Reverend Rafi from the Union of Armenian. I am Reverend Rafi Masurlian. I am Armenian and I belong to the Evangelical Church, Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East. Uh, we cover countries of Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iran, Egypt, uh, Cyprus, uh, Greece and Sydney, but I will focus on Lebanon. I am a graduate of Haigazan University uh, with a BA in Education, uh, plus with, with, with an MD from Niri School of Theology. Uh, our, we are evangelical church, but congregational church. And in Lebanon, we run five churches. And also we run uh, four schools in Lebanon, four schools, uh, three in Beirut and one in Anjar in a village and, we, and with a boarding uh, section. Uh, we have a center for social work. Uh, plus we have a university and we try to serve uh, the Lebanese society with that. Uh, plus we have two common projects with the Armenian Orthodox Church. Uh, uh, we call it Kahel Old People's Home and also one in the Shuf area, uh, Azunie uh, Senatorium. Thank you so much. So as a pastor, you start your day, of course, you have to solve different kind of problems. Finding diesel, trying to solve uh, energy issues, school issues, social work. So I feel that uh, the, the church is doing some kind of a social work, educational work, and, and multi-dimensional uh, multi work that, that we're doing. And it's a very challenging for us. Could you also, in addition to that, say a few words on, how, on weather and how the situation in Ukraine has affected or further deteriorated the situation? Of course, the situation in Ukraine affected us because suddenly there was a wheat problem in Lebanon and because in, in the explosion this, we had big uh, places where we can put wheat, th these were destroyed, so we didn't have reserves in Lebanon, so suddenly there was a crisis in terms of wheat and so the prices increased. Of course, energy prices increased, which means we're paying more for diesel and families are paying more to buy uh, private electricity from private generator and these people are we call them mafia uh, and every month the amount that you have to pay for private generators is increasing of course uh, products are getting more expensive uh, and we like it or not uh, we are affected by what's happening in the global world also so this is a, this is a small example and maybe to just add one random, <laughs> very tangible example. I visited uh, Lebanon the last time in July and I had dinner at a friend's place. And we were sitting at the table having dinner and suddenly the public energy supply came back. And then she just jumped up and she said, okay, stay here, I'll be back in a minute. And she, she was running to her laundry room where she had prepared the laundry in the machine. The pulver was already there and she switched it on and said, this is how I have to do it every day. We just sit here and wait and then we jump up and do whatever needs electricity for the half hour, maximum two hours a day that we have public energy supply. 
So yeah, this is just uh, one more example from my end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the impact of this crisis um, on the church. And Reverend Joseph, maybe you can share a little bit about what has been, have been the consequences of all of these um, crises that we mentioned of the situation on the church, on the church community, on the operations of the church? Yeah. Well, I should say, in, in, in the time of crisis, uh, churches become, usually, if they are committed enough to their Christian faith, they become a better church in the time of crisis. So with this regard, I think the crisis affected the church positively. I mean, because the place of the church among the people, among the suffering uh, people, so this is where uh, the church is tested, the church is witnessing. Uh, so I think, I think uh, the crisis affected positively the church uh, in in regard to its real essence, real essence as a church. But again, a lot of challenges, for example, I mean, just to give you an idea, we are a central office which, which is helping 38 churches in Syria and Lebanon. All of a sudden, we cannot withdraw from the banks more than $1,000 a month to run all this. And I can tell you, this is an opportunity to tell you, without our partners, without our partners, we couldn't have done it at all. So uh, all of a sudden, we are no more putting uh, money in the banks. We are dealing with the money uh, coming from the churches or from the schools or just to make things uh, run, uh, so, but we we felt the obligation with the help of the partners to respond to the crisis, to be among the people, to uh, to be a to be the church, to be the church for for people. So as a synod, I'm talking about uh, our uh, my, my my church. I mean, we responded in many ways. Uh, for example, uh, Marina mentioned the one million and a half. Syrian refugees in Lebanon, we opened four, uh, other than our 11 schools, I mean, we opened in Lebanon four refugee schools for children, because leaving those children in the streets will lead them to extremism, will lead them to, to, to all kind of exploitation, so that was a moral obligation that, so we, we established four uh, refugee schools in different parts of the country, in different parts, especially where there are camps for those refugees. Uh, we established a relief program, relief program to help people just with food. Uh, they, they need food, they need, they need oil, they need uh, basics. Every, every family, almost every family, they needed the basics. So. We, we, we pay vouchers every, every month for the neediest uh, fa families. And I think we are supporting 300, 300 families every month uh, with, with this relief program. Again, uh, we, we, through, through our, uh, our uh, Compassion Protestant Society, which is a non-profit faith-based uh, organization uh, for the Synod. We are helping, we help the countryside, people who have small gardens from 50 meters square to 200 meters square. We offer them agro-basket just to plant and eat from, from one, what, what, what they plant. Uh, we also uh, try to help uh, more thousands of uh, uh, students in our school to stay in the school 
to help them scholarship. Uh, and we were able to help uh, the teachers with $40, $40 every month just to keep them teaching, just to keep them teaching the, the children. And uh, we, 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 uh, our clinics started uh, distributing medicines free of charge for, for the needy, sick people. So we, we are responding in every way possible, just waiting that, waiting till we reach the level zero. We are still going down. We are hoping to reach the zero level from there, we, have, we start to have expectations to go up, little by little. And I think in the coming three years, uh, our institutions will, will uh, be healed somehow, and we, we can go, and also the banking sector will, 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 be, uh, will be better. Uh, just imagine, I mean, with all this crisis, the parliament, up till now, they haven't issued the law for capital control. You know what does that mean? This means that the capital control is, is applied only for the poor and ordinary people. But the political class, some privileged people, they are still able to go around the system, to go around the system. So this is uh, how we, we are trying to respond and uh, 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 we, we are filled with hope. We feel that we are more healthy church in being among the people in this uh, dark age. Thank you, and thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Reverend Rafi, I know that the impact on the Armenian evangelical churches is very similar. Um, you too run schools and um, you too face the, the energy supply crisis and all of these things. Um, I know that you are particularly um, engaged also with the Armenian evangelical schools in Lebanon. Um, you've been serving as school director as, uh, while also serving as pastor in the church. Um, could you share a little bit about how are the schools, how, first how is the Armenian evangelical church responding in Lebanon and part with a particular focus on the schools. How are you trying at least to provide hope and a future for young people in the schools? Yeah, uh, of course our problems are similar and we have similar, pro similar programs. Uh, they, are doing, they, they are working within their churches and schools and we are working within our churches. Of course all these is the responsibility of the government. But when there is no government, we try to do our best. We cannot fulfill everything uh, but we try as a church to do our best. And a positive thing is that people come to the church now. They know that even if they are not churchcomers, but they belong to you, they know that you're there. So they come, they bring their issues, and they ask your help. And of course, we feel responsible towards our people, whether in the church or whether in the school. I told you, as a union, we have we're running four schools. So we feel responsible for the kids to give them education, regardless of all the situations in Lebanon. At least they can have a full, full academic year. So they pay very little because uh, we give them almost a full sponsorship because our partners are helping us. And also we feel responsible for our teachers. Uh, yes, we. They get their salaries, uh, plus uh, beyond their salaries also, we're trying to give them every month an extra amount uh, based on our abilities to help them to survive. So when everything in, in Lebanon is hopeless, I believe that, and we, we as evangelicals, we believe that education is the only way for, peop for young people to have development. And that they can have a chance in the future to change their situation and to, and to have a better life. So that's why we're there. We're trying to give them a good education. Uh, plus, of course, uh, the, the Christian values because we teach the Bible in our school. And, of course, we try to teach them these values that will 
help them to have patience, to have perseverance, and to have, and to have hope, and to face these situations. And as my brother said, uh, we're not hopeless. We're, we're, we are hopeful that the situation will change in the future, but we need uh, to increase the immunity of our people uh, to persevere and to endure in these difficult social, financial, and, and, and political situations that, that we're facing. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Joseph, you mentioned earlier that this crisis has, has brought out also the best from the church. Could you elaborate a little bit more about what you mean by that? I mean, what are the, maybe, what, what is the identity, the core identity that this has brought out from the church during this crisis situation? Uh, the, you know, I, I see, let me tell you, the, the, the most evil situation is when people, they are left only to hope in God on this earth. You know, people, when you, you rob people from all kind of hopes, all kind of uh, promises, and you leave them only for God. Huh? So they, they go to God. And this is the situation now in, in Syria and in Lebanon both. People are left to God. And when people, they are left to God, they search for a place where to find God. And this is where they are led naturally to the community of God, to the church. And the church cannot betray God when when have those people around seeking God in the midst of their crisis they don't know they they don't know what they want but they know that there is hope there in that place so this is where we feel that our identity is being practiced fully as a community of God in that sense we are recharged as a church to be a better church. That's, that I, I can see it in every congregation in Syria and Lebanon. Uh, all of a sudden, our churches are filled. And we don't, we don't practice proselytism. And some people would say, would say, can we join the church, your church? I say, no, no, no. Not now for sure. That's a question for the future. Right now, we don't want more members. We want you to feel embraced by the love of this community. So, uh, uh, and, and we feel, if you allow me, I mean, this is, this is always a story in my mind about a very depressed wife taken by her husband to a psychiatrist. And after a long session of clinical history, the psychiatrist stood and hugged the wife, a long hug. And all of a sudden, the wife started smiling. And the doctor turned to the husband and said, now do you know what to do? And the husband said, how many times every month I should bring it here to you? <laughs> this is sometimes the people is our wife as a church. We cannot leave them in such situation to the government, to the secular world, to the ideologies. This is, they are our wife. We have to embrace them. We have to heal them in this situation. Thank you very much. Um, we will have time for, for questions, um, but I want to ask one final question to Reverend Rafi. Um, you mentioned earlier that you are hopeful when looking into the future. What gives you hope? I am hopeful because God is faithful and God does miracles. When the blast happened in Beirut, I was saved by a miracle because I was in one of our schools very near to the seaport. When I came home, 
I saw the destruction on the way, and I saw the, the destruction in our schools. And the second day, like people from outside were helping us. And God opened doors and windows of, of help, and we rebuilt our institutions, and uh, really, uh, we are able to survive, to help our people, and I believe that God, that's because of God's being, being faithful. If I will look to our leaders, our political leaders, it's a, it's a corrupt system. But I believe that God will do a miracle for Lebanon and for Syria and, and for the Middle East, and things will change. Uh, we need to be, not for me, not to be a better church, but to be a serving church. That's the challenge for me, and of course to mobilize our, especially young people also, uh, to serve and uh, to take care of each other, to take care of the children, of the junior groups. Now, we have also problems uh, with human resources, you know. Many young people left. I know many young people from our groups, nurses, now they are in the, in the Gulf, in Qatar, in Dubai, and they are working. So the problem, you, you invest on these people over years, they do discipleship and they leave. So you need to, to prepare again, and they leave. So uh, we are working in these situations, uh, but, but we are trying uh, to do our best. And of course, again, the challenge for me as a pastor and for my church is to be a serving church and to serve with, with love and with dedication, regardless of all the situations that, that, that we are in. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is open now for questions. And please quickly introduce yourself, say your name, and then maybe also say to whom the question is directed. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Kelling. I'm from the Ang Anglican Church of Jerusalem in the Middle East, uh, based in Amman in Jordan. So firstly, just my thanks to both the National Evangelical Church and the Armenian Evangelical Church for the support they're showing and the love of Christ they're showing in Lebanon and Syria. My question is this, what is our role as Christians in advocating for systemic change from uh, the governments in the places we are? Specifically, we as the church uh, and all the churches ecumenically in Lebanon. Maybe this is a question to both. Do you want to start? Or? I think we have to reform ourselves as churches first, because if you look at the church in the Middle East in general, we have the seeds of the same problems that the society has and we have to fight against it. We have problem of patriarchy. We have problem with the role of women in the church. We have, the prob we have problems with the role of youth. Uh, we have problem of democracy and shared governance. All of these you can find them in Middle Eastern churches. And we have to be brave to say, Unless we start with ourselves, we cannot go further to criticize the, the political system. But I'm saying this uh, not, I mean, in general, I'm talking about the ecclesial situation in the Middle East. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying that Protestant faith reached that part of the world, our part of the world in the Middle East in the early 19th century. And uh, it, it didn't flourish very much. We are still very small minority. And maybe because the society was not able to receive those reform. So, I'm not saying that we are perfect. We have also problems as Protestant in the Middle East, in the world. We have to watch ourselves. But this is my, my question. I'm before, before, before 
attacking the politics, we have to start with ourselves inside. Do you want to add? Or okay, thank you. More questions? It's uh, more of a comment, actually. Schatz, nawa galim vo tu kosterek ev asigais sek ev im sier tasi ma schat zanere ev es schat tu khurum ev es ameno schat schat arot ganem vo Syria ev Libana ev amen Middle Eastern ev genere matik nere tisi bes as chap huis gudan gor anti matik nere un ev as chap love genain gor vo ev youth ev genere ev amen amen ev Tuk shat geneko, shat gok neko. Yev es es parer chunim vo genam esel es shat shnor galam yev es mischt tezi yev pasta nere tezi bes tuk mischt imi mit kesmet yev es shat liba na hai ingen nero nim vo isi ameno kesengor inch bes keshe ameno inch peits anongal huis sunias vazin yev as huis chunein yete matik nere tezi bes chiga yev es shat shat shnor galam shat mersi vo tuk I believe that was Armenian. Do you want to summarize what you just said, or do you want to? Yes. Uh, she knows about the problems in Lebanon through, through her friends, Armenian friends, and she really appreciates what we're doing as pastors in giving our young people and also our people in trying to help them and trying to give them hope. So this was a summary of what she's saying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Referent Friederike Münzing. Do you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm here from the Welcoming Church. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I have two questions. You mentioned the Mafia. Um, do they also belong to any Christian churches and are there any contacts? You also mentioned, second question, the corruption. Do these, some of these people or the political class belong to Christian churches and other contacts? Okay. I'm not sure if we talked about the mafia. I don't think so. But you, you mentioned it. So maybe, Reverend Rafi, do you want to respond? No. The, the owners of electricity, the generators in the streets and in the, in the towns, when I say mafia, it's, it's like a coalition. So they together, they control everything. They control the prices and they manipulate the people and they, they, they overcharge them uh, with money. That's, that's uh, when I said mafia, I said it in that, in that, in that sense. Concerning the second questions, uh, yes, part of our leaders, uh, we have Muslim leaders and Christian leaders in Lebanon. And I think that corruption is among all so for me, I doubt if they are real, real Christian because uh, you may be Christian, maybe nominal Christian, but corruption also is is there. So. May I say something about? Uh, yeah, they they are Christians in in our part of the world. Every citizen is known as. But by, by his or her religion. Shiite, Sunni, Protestant, Catholic, Maronite. This is how we are classified by the government. And it's an, it's an Ottoman heritage. It's an Ottoman heritage. Unfortunately, we were not able to move to a full civil society where we are citizens, period. So yes, they are Christians, but... Uh, they are not affiliated. They they don't coordinate with uh, with their church leaders. They are not related to the policy of their churches, but they are Christians. We we suffer in the Middle East from tribal Christianity, tribal Christianity, and and the the concept of church is mixed between two things: the ch church as we understand it as Christian, and community. So there is, there is big uh, uh, faith community called 
for example, the Sunni, but very few among that community is uh, real committed Sunni. It's the same for the Maronites, it's the same for, for the Orthodox, it's the same for, for Protestant. So uh, it's a complicated uh, word. I mean, it's, it's hard for Europeans to understand how, the, how is the relation between religion and politics. There is no that separation between uh, church and state like here. So they are not Christians. <laughs> Shortly. <laughs> yes, this, this also was my question. And, but the, uh, the Christian churches could excommunicate the Christian uh, uh, politicians. Theoretically, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, never, unfortunately, never, never happened. Never happened. Uh, because uh, the church is trapped into politics. You know, just to give you an idea, I, I don't know how, how many of you knows about uh, the parliament in Lebanon is, uh, consists of 50% Christians, 50% Muslims. Among the Muslim part, 30% uh, uh, of that 50 should be Sunni, 30% of that part should be Shiite, then 15 should be Druze, and then you have Alawite, you have it. And when you come to the 50% of the Christians, 30%, uh, uh, well, 40% should be Maronite, and maybe 25% should be Orthodox, and, and, and. And then the smallest is for the Protestant. We have only one, one out of one, 128 members, we have one Protestant. We have problem. So this one Protestant might be committed Protestant, affiliated to the church, and might be very secular, like a lot of here in Europe. They don't care about, uh, but they, they remember that they were baptized in, uh, in, in, in the Protestant church. So this is, this is the combination. In the, the whole society is religion and politics, they are mixed. And uh, it's a tribal, it's a tribal. Let's say it, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying, not trying to please you. I'm saying the truth. I tell this every day in my country. I'm not telling something different now before you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Johanna. I represent Church of Sweden or ACT Church of Sweden. Thank you so much for your testimonies. Um, uh, we, you, made, you talked a bit about the political class and maybe a, a corrupt political class. And I was wondering if you see a, uh, an alternative to, to that political class that could potentially in the future you know, uh, take on a different, more inclusive, democratic, not corrupt leadership. Are there, you know, is there an alternative that, and, and what does it look like? Now, lately there were elections in Lebanon and the people elected almost 80% of the same, same leaders. We were hoping for change. So next change will come maybe after four or five years with, with, with new elections. But there was a, a little change which, uh, which happened. As Pastor said, religion and politics is very much intermingled in Lebanon. And that's why uh, it's very, very difficult to bring a quick change. Uh, that's why I believe that uh, that's a long process. It will take time. But in, for me, as I was, saying, I was saying to Marina yesterday, that uh, what we do in our schools and how we educate our young kids, that's important. So we need, we need to focus on education. We need 
to focus, to teach them to have integrity in their life, to have values in their life, and to be away from, from corruption. They should know that the, situ the situation we are, it's, be it's because of this corruption. So we, we don't need to repeat it again after, after, so, after so many years. Uh, it will take time, it will take time. But it may change. Maybe just one quick additional question from my end. You mentioned that there was a little change during the elections in May yeah. this year. I mean, some uh, younger you know, representatives were elected to parliament for the first time. Do you think that that is going to change at least something? We need to wait and see because the start was not good because they didn't have time for electing the head of parliament. So they needed to come together uh, to have some dialogue because also they, they are diverse group with different, different ideas. So, so we need to see and we need to, we need to wait. That's, that's my opinion. I don't know if Robert will say something else. You were very convinced that change is about to come. Yeah, yes, there, there is a change. For example, there is 13, I think 13, 11 or 13, 13 uh, uh, member of the parliament now, they were elected from the civil society. They don't belong to any political party. So this is a huge change in the political structure of, but it's still not enough. In, in the Middle East, there is two ways for fast change. No, there is one, one way of fast change, and that's risky. Military coup. That's in the Middle East. A military coup can change things fastly. Coup. Uh, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so that's one. The other choice is democracy. And this is what Lebanon is sticking to. We don't want any military coup. We, uh, we want democratic change because it's very difficult uh, any violence, change, change by violence in Lebanon because you have Christians, you have Muslims, you have Sunni, you have Shiite. It's so risky. So we prefer that even if it takes long, it's more safe for the future of the country to go democratically. Oh, thank you. Uh, Christoph Hildebrand Ayers from the church in Württemberg and friend of Schneller schools in Lebanon and Jordan. So um, two years ago, there were many young people out in the streets discussing the future of the Lebanon and searching for alternatives and starting from the grassroots with initiatives. And uh, there was much hope. So what happened? to all these initiatives and where are these young people or these people uniting uh, despite all the diversions they had? You're referring to 2019, that appraisal and uh, with big numbers, but gradually uh, it was the, I think, the political parties, they had some infiltration and sometimes uh, mixed with religion. So things, things went, went down. Uh, that's, why we, that's why the elections we had lately, uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a big change. So we were expecting a bigger change, but in Lebanon, there is always a quick polarization towards a political party and, and the leaders, some, this is my opinion, the leaders sometimes, they are very smart in, in playing with the religious feelings of, of people. So once you make the issue religious, so things become polarized and people, they go back to their to their parties. That's why we didn't have a big change. And we were surprised for that. But as, as we said, 13 members, uh, new members from civil society, 
that was a big step in Lebanon, and uh, we we hope that uh, they will bring change in the in the political life of of Lebanon. So. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. If there is one more question. This uh, changes topic slightly, but stays within Lebanon. Uh, we know that through the legacy of the civil war that Lebanon has a complicated relationship hosting Syrians from the occupation by Syria of Lebanon and the Palestinian population that it has supported through, uh, through migration and, and displacement themselves. But we also have uh, a large number of uh, migrant workers in Lebanon who are suffering themselves. Um, and this, the theme of this assembly has been the, the inclusive nature of Christ's love for all. And I just wanted to hear from both of you uh, on how the church can, and if it can, show love for those marginalized migrant workers, often working in domestic work or in, in construction, uh, but particularly domestic work in Lebanon. And if there's anything more we can add or pray for in that regard. You know, the migrant workers, they were, they, they, uh, they became very large community in Lebanon because of the previous uh, luxury of the prosperity of the Lebanese. So all of a sudden, the Lebanese who have enough money and they made use of the uh, of the currency, the purchasing power of the currency, so they used migrant workers. Well, yes, they, many of those, they are suffering because they, they work for families who are not uh, educated enough, uh, civilized enough to, to, to know their, that they have to be given their rights fully. Now, the number became very, very few number. Uh, people, Egyptians, uh, Ethiopians, uh, Sri Lankan, Bangladeshi, all, most of them left, more of them. But they, they left with scars. And every now and then I watch the social media, they come up and speak about uh, their, their, their suffering with, with certain families. Now the church, some churches, uh, for example, in our, our church, in my church in, in Beirut, I mean, all, every worship service, they, we have migrant workers with the, with the translation uh, equipment so they understand what's going on. Some other churches, they gave them facilities, so they, they come and, and uh, share. And some churches, even, they, have, they appointed a certain pastor to follow up with their uh, accusations, problems with, uh, with, with, the employers, with the employers. But still, Lebanese society, suffers from racism we have to say it like the west we are not different from any other country in in the world and we have to the the responsibility of the church to speak up and fight ag against this uh, uh, there are certain uh, certain ngos uh, they have uh, volunteers lawyers who are ready to follow up all the problems of the migrant. But I tell you, the problems comes from both, from the government of those migrants coming with their embassies and with the Lebanese government. They are not treated uh, justly because of these two parties, because you cannot rely on ordinary people to apply justice. You apply on government, on system, to, to put rules and follow it. Thank you very much. Um, we have reached the end of our time. I thank you both so much for taking the time, for sharing your time, your wisdom with us today. 
I felt it was really important to lift up the situation in Lebanon and the role the churches are playing in this country and in the region in general. So I thank you very much. Um, I thank you for coming and I wish you all a very good rest of the assembly and a blessed time with good companionship.